Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. I am so honored to be here from the Theosophical Society and talking with you today about philosophy as a form of the mysteries. So I do want to tell you a little bit more about myself just to give you some additional context about this particular talk. I am a theosophist. I joined the National Capital Lodge in 1999, and I have been studying theosophical texts for a number of years prior to finding the National Capital Lodge in Washington, D.C. I am also a contemporary pagan priestess, specifically serving the Lord of Light, Apollon, Apollo, and the goddess Athena the goddess of wisdom. And this particular talk is in service of an, a facet of the call to service that I received from these two great ones. And just to demystify that a little bit, my understanding is that there are many great beings, including Apollo and Athena, who have certain things that they want to see done. And I believe that I received a call in order to do work in alignment with some of the things that they wish to see done. And I said, yes. And this is generally under the umbrella of the Contemporary Pagan Project, which I understand in part as going back into pre-Christian times and looking for where are the threads that got cut or dropped that have some value that maybe we can bring forward and rebirth appropriately into our contemporary context. And part of that, which is the part of my call that this is related to, is working to rebirth philosophy, which is incredibly important in ancient Greece, specifically as a sacred practice and as a sacred path. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go into a little bit more about my not remotely hidden agenda, and then we're going to discuss what are the mysteries. I'm making a claim here that you can understand philosophy as a form of the mystery. So what are the mysteries? And then we're going to discuss a bit about what is philosophy from an ancient Hellenic and ancient Greek standpoint, and then explore why it might be that philosophy could lead to the same ends as the mysteries. And finally, we will conclude with some very practical considerations about rebirthing philosophy as a practice and as a path. So my not remotely hidden or secret agenda is that I want to see us rehabilitate philosophy by reclaiming it as a sacred practice. So the Greek word Philosophia, which is where we get philosophy. I think it's very important to start there. It's really what it means is a combination of two different words, philos, which means love. It is one of the Greek words that can be translated as love and Sophia, wisdom. So to be a philosopher is to be a lover of wisdom. And I think it is first very important for us to understand that there are a number of words in Greek that could be translated as love, philos is the kind of love that is often translated as friendship. But what it really means is that deeply personal, very affectionate form of love. It is the kind of love that you feel for your best friend, for those people who you are close to in your family. The way in which we in our current society think of romantic love, that is a combination of eros, which is the sexual longing, with philos, that deep, affectionate, personal feeling. So when they chose the word philosophia, they are saying to be a lover of wisdom in this very deeply personal, affectionate way. And I think that's important because one of the things that I think is problematic that I want us to kind of rehabilitate is that in our current society, if people encounter philosophy at all. It is probably within the context of our higher educational system in which they encounter it as one of the academic disciplines. And the way it is frequently encountered is very kind of dry. It is something that only appeals to a very narrow range of mental activity as opposed to this full human encounter with wisdom that is affecting them on all levels and is deeply affectionate. So that is the first thing. And I do think another piece of the reason why the way in which we encounter philosophy can often be feeling rather dry and like it's not appealing to our full humanity is that we often approach it through a descriptive process 
rather than as practice. So we are incredibly, incredibly fortunate that we have this extraordinary wealth of philosophical texts available to us. And the way in which I understand philosophical texts, and this is actually how I also understand religious texts, is that what they really are is that these are maps. They are maps that if we can follow them, if we can follow the thought that is laid out, can lead us to particular types of experiences often in consciousness. And so the way in which it's often taught though, is that as an analogy, we'll just pretend that you have, you know, a map of Paris from 1919 and a map of Paris from 1943. And you're looking at these maps and you're talking about how are they similar? How are they different? And maybe we talk about whether or not one of them is higher quality than the other. But what we're not doing is taking that map and having it as a tool that is leading us through an experience of moving through Paris, which is the real intention of a map. And so I'm just using that as an analogy because I would like us to think about the possibility of approaching philosophical texts with this idea in mind that what we're trying to do is follow the thought and have an experience in our consciousness. Another thing that I really want us to kind of challenge and take back is this idea that Philosophy is only for experts. You know, if you're to go into a regular kind of social conversation right now and say, I am a philosopher, that almost sounds like it's completely hubristic. And of course, this is very different than how it was understood in the ancient Greek times, in which what you were saying is, I have dedicated my life to living as a lover of wisdom. And so I really would like us to be able to reclaim this sense and again, to try to think about philosophy as a sacred way of life, not just as an academic discipline. So now I want to go into a little bit about the mysteries. What are the mysteries? The mysteries are a very specific form of ancient Hellenic, ancient Greek cult, later Hellenistic and Roman, and it is quite different than civic cult. So civic cult are all of those big rituals that the primary intention of them is for the community to build and maintain appropriate sacred relationships with the gods, with the ancestors, with the spirits of their places and so forth. But it's about the relationship of the community to the spiritual world. It is also quite different than household cult, which is that practice that is about ensuring that the family has appropriate relationships with the spiritual world. It is a very personal form of religious cult. The oldest that we have is the Eleusinian mysteries. The Eleusinian mysteries are the mysteries of Demeter and her daughter, Cori. Now, Cori is often sometimes referred to as Persephone, but within the context of the Eleusinian mysteries, the only word that's ever used for her is Cori, maiden. And the Eleusinian mysteries were at Eleusis. It's about 14 miles outside of Athens. And this is an incredibly ancient cult. At the latest, it is in the early Elatic period, which would be the early Bronze Age. And it may go back even into the late Neolithic. It is incredibly, incredibly ancient. And it's very site specific. It is rooted in a place that has a number of factors of sacred geography that means that it must be there. You can't move the Eleusinian mysteries. So the Eleusinian mysteries begin begin incredibly, incredibly early, and they go through 396 CE when the temple is finally sacked. And as I said, the Eleusinian Mysteries is tied to sacred geography. So once the temple is sacked, they cannot exist elsewhere. So at their height, the Eleusinian Mysteries initiated about 30,000 people a year. So it was, uh, and they came from all over the world. The requirement was that you had to be able to speak and understand Greek, but you didn't even have to be Greek. So there, it was a hugely important religious cult for a long time. Now, this type of religion, though, beginning with the Eleusinian Mysteries, it births a number of types of other cults that are functioning similarly to the Eleusinian mysteries that operate elsewhere. And there are a number of important characteristics of the mysteries. What the mysteries provide is transformation, deep transformation through ritual. So it is 
personal. It is an individual who is going through this deep transformation and it is initiatory and optional. There's no requirement for anyone to be an initiate. So it is an optional form of religion. Now this initiation, this is very important to understand here because what the claim is, is that the person who is going into the mysteries, so they're before the mysteries, there's some early purification that happens And then the person that comes out of the mysteries is fundamentally different in some way and is changed forever as a result of what goes on during this process of initiation. And the claim is that this difference, this thing that happens, the transformation that happens during the process of initiation is happening at the immortal level of their being. It is happening at the level of their being that survives death. And that in some way, the effect of this offsets the burdens of mortality. And that that is what the mysteries are about. And it does this in some fashion through divine intimacy. Within the course of this initiation, the initiate is in a divinely intimate relationship, a personal relationship. Um, encounter with the deities, usually those who are associated with the particular mystery cult. And there are a number of them. As I mentioned, there's some site-specific ones that have something in their sacred geography that means that they cannot move. And the Eleusinian Mysteries is the oldest. About 14 miles outside of Athens, if you're looking and you want to go visit because you can go to the sanctuary, it's extraordinary. The word that you'd be looking for is alephsis in modern Greece. But there are also the mysteries of the greater gods of Samothraki and the Andanian mysteries. These are examples of site-specific mystery initiation cults. There are a number of others that are not site specific. They're not tied to a specific sacred geography and therefore they can be replicated and spread. And probably the most important of these are the Dionysiac mysteries, those of Dionysus and the Orphic mysteries, which come out of the Dionysiac mysteries. Now the Orphic mysteries are particularly important in philosophy because we are really very sure that a number of the seminal early philosophers were initiates of the Orphic Mysteries, including Pythagoras and Plato. There are also the Mysteries of Kibbele, the great Lydian mother goddess, and Mithras, who is a Phrygian deity. And when he is imported into Hellenistic culture, they create a type of mystery cult around him. And there are the Mysteries of Isis. Now, Isis herself is obviously, Isis is a very, very ancient deity, but the specific form of her worship as the Mysteries of Isis actually is comparatively newer in that it arises during the syncretistic combination that is very prevalent in Hellenistic and then Roman times when the Egyptian and the Greek merge. So the telos of the mysteries, telos is a great ancient Greek word. What it really means is like the the finale, the final part. It also means the ultimate purpose of something, um, its true meaning and purpose. And it is related to the word that is often used for initiation. So the telos of the mysteries is that there is some alteration in the individual at the level of being in which they are immortal. So this change that happens in the initiation and that level of being in which they are immortal in a way that carries over through death and rebirth. Now, not all of the mysteries are explicit about reincarnation, but the Orphic mysteries are completely explicit about the fact that they are talking about reincarnation, that this change that happens affects you for multiple lifetimes. So now I want to do a very, very brief introduction to Hellenic philosophy. And of course, there are entire libraries filled with information about ancient Greek philosophy. So this is a very brief introduction here. So as I made a big deal about, and I think it is incredibly important, is that to be a philosopher is to live as a lover of wisdom, that that is really what it means in this deep, full human way. And Philosophy, interestingly, arises in two different cultures simultaneously, so at the same time, but independently. And those cultures are ancient India 
and ancient Greece. So they arise separately. They actually began influencing each other during the time in which Aristotle was still alive as a result of Alexander the Great moving into India. And they continue to have mutual influence for quite some time before they separate out again. But it arises in ancient Greece with two fundamental questions. There are two things that are kind of running through as consistent elements throughout all of ancient Greek philosophy. And the first one of those questions is, what is the true nature of reality? And accompanying that is, what does this mean for living a good human life? Those two are always together when you're looking at ancient Greek philosophy. So basically what happens here is that in the beginning, it's over in Melitos, which is in the Ionian area. So this is on the Greek cities that are part of what is now Turkey. And you have a bunch of intellectuals and Thales is the one who is first typically identified as being our first philosopher. And they're looking very carefully at the world. And what they're realizing is that when you first look at the world through kind of a common sense understanding, it looks like there's a bunch of stability and that things are, are fairly you know, um, stable and are permanent. And then when you begin looking more closely, you realize that absolutely nothing nothing is permanent and stable. Everything is constantly changing and it's just the speed of the change that we're seeing that's different. So they're trying to then understand because everything now, when you're looking at it more closely, we recognize it as changing. And yet there does seem to be some form of continuity or stability that must be behind all of this that is not necessarily immediately apparent. And they begin wondering what is the nature of that? Why is there this sense of continuity and stability when even though we look at things closely, everything is constantly in flux? So again, they're starting to ask, what is the nature of reality? And as part of that, they are beginning to be very distrustful about appearances and about the testimony of just the senses in and of themselves. So distrustful of this kind of common sense sensory-based apprehension of the world. And those people who have studied Indian philosophy, you will begin to notice some very fast similarities, even though they're coming up with this independently between those two. So ethics then, this idea of what is the right thing to do and how do we know the right thing to do are at the foundation of Hellenic philosophy. And that is because discovering the implications for leading a good human life as you are looking for what is the nature of reality is a constant motivation. And so we begin to see the rise of really pretty much all these big branches of philosophy that we have now. So you have metaphysics, you have epistemology, which is the philosophical discussion of how do we know what we know, empiricism, politics in terms of political science, political philosophy, and aesthetics. But under all of this, they're always asking, what is the good? What is the nature of the good? And so there's a fabulous, fabulous ancient Greek word that is often used that is called eudaimonia, which, you know, we talk about eudaimonic ethics. And eudaimonia is another one of these compound words, and it's often translated as happiness. But what it really means, you means good. And thymon is a category word that is used for any type of spirit. So it is used for any kind of being in which their primary essence is not in a body. So it can be used for the gods. It can be used for the ancestors to talk about thymon. When it is applied to us, what it's saying is that aspect of ourselves that is not essentially our body. It is our spirit. And so eudaimonia, what it's meaning is to live as a good spirit. And so this idea of ethics, philosophical ethics, is trying to understand how is it that we as a human being can live as a good spirit because it is only when we're living as a good spirit, paying close attention to that part of ourselves that is not encapsulated in our body, that we can be happy, that it that is why it is related to happiness. So now I'm gonna do a lightning fast tour, a lightning fast tour of Hellenic philosophy, just to be sure that if you decide that you're interested in trying to look at some of these things on your own, and I hope that you do, that it will give you a little bit of background about where you wanna go looking. So again, some preliminary notes here. 
One of the things to note, and I find this absolutely fascinating, you have this rise early of philosophy, and in almost no time at all, we have in at least nascent form pretty much every single philosophical position that we currently have. So there is not unified thought. It's not like there is the school of Greek philosophy. There's a lot of them. One of the things that I wanted to give you is this kind of uh, caution is that I really encourage people to go and look at primary texts and to be careful about looking at the sources through a monotheistic lens. The reason that this is important is we obviously have a number of incredibly, incredibly influential thinkers who then influence later philosophical thought. So for example, Plato is very influential on the thought of St. Augustine. And then St. Augustine is very influential on a whole bunch of others. And you have this entire divine ideas tradition, which is wonderful and beautiful within Christianity. But if you only read Plato through an Augustinian lens, it may obscure certain things that are also there. So I wanted to encourage people to go and to try to take a look at the original sources. Of course, we're incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful to the great scholars, not just of Christianity, but of the Muslim scholars. I mean, you know, it is thanks to the brilliant Muslim scholars that we still have so many of Aristotle's texts because they're the ones who saved them. In Islam, Aristotle is the sage and his work along with obviously the Quran and the Hadith and so forth is foundational in all of Muslim philosophy. So, but at the same time, if you wanna see something that to open up all of the possibilities, going back and reading the original sources and trying to be careful that we're not being overly influenced by specific directions that they've already gone is a useful exercise. The other thing to just remember is that we are missing many sources. Unfortunately, we are. Of course, they're very ancient. And so it's not surprising that we're missing a lot. But as an example of this, for Plato, we only have his dialogues. Now, his dialogues are his published works that he was intending to be read by a general intellectual audience. We do not have his lectures that he gave to his specific dedicated students. For Aristotle, it's the reverse. We only have Aristotle's lectures that he gave to his deep students who were in intensive training with him. And we do not have any of his dialogues, although we have references to them, that were his published works meant for the general public. So what that means, and it's just important for us to remember the limitations here, is that when we're doing something like comparing Plato and Aristotle, we're not comparing comparable sources. And I think that that has led sometimes to an overemphasis of the divergence between these two. So for instance, there are some people who look at Aristotle as though he was moving very, very far away from Plato. And then I don't actually see that. What I see is I see him delivering a number of correctives to Plato, but I don't think that he ever abandons Platonic thought by any stretch of the imagination. So I have broken up our lightning fast tour into before Socrates, at the time of Socrates, and after Socrates. And the reason for that is that in so many ways, Socrates really is our linchpin where something fundamental happens and things go in a different direction. So prior to Socrates, we have a number of what they're called now is pre-Socratic. So it's not like I'm just making this up. That's <laughs> what so they're actually called in the literature. So the pre-Socratics include, you know, some of those people I was talking about, like Thales and so forth, and Aximander um, and so forth over in Miletus. And what they're really trying to do, they're the early ones who are trying to understand what is permanent behind all of the change that they're observing. And you see the rise of a number of early atomist theories and also our understanding of the elements. So earth, air, fire, and water. And then Aristotle is the one who adds ether. All of that is coming out of some of these pre-Socratics. They are fascinating. I got to say they're fascinating partially because I'm just so amazed by them. The fact that they are able using nothing but reason to come up with some of these various theories that are really interesting to read from a contemporary perspective. And again, part of what they're doing here is that as they're trying to think through and trying to understand how do we know what is behind all of the stuff that we can observe, 
they're realizing that they are using some capacity within themselves that is a way of knowing that is neither sensory nor is it sensory correlative. So this is, of course, what we later are talking about with reason, but I think it's very important for those of us who do various kinds of spiritual work that what we're talking about here is operating in a level of being that's neither sensory nor is it sensory correlative, which means it's above the astral. Everything in the astral is sensory correlative. Like when we're in the realm of dreams or in the kinds of meditations and so forth, um, in which we are operating in something that's sensory correlative, this way of knowing is not that. So one of the early uh, pre-Socratics is very important is Parmenides. Parmenides is a monist. So he comes to the conclusion that all of the world of differentiation, all the differentiation is really illusory, that there's a single thing and all differentiation is ultimately illusory. This will sound very familiar for those people who are looking at it from an Indian lens. <laughs> He's also a mystic. And when he is a very old man, he visits Athens. And while he is in Athens, he has a discourse, a discussion with a very young Socrates. And Socrates, from the evidence that we have of Plato, this is incredibly formative for Socrates in his own development. Another prior to Socrates, early Socrates philosophical school is the Pythagoreans. So Pythagoras founded a commune of philosophers in what is now Italy, Crotona. And it is probably, it's very, very, very likely that he was an Orphic initiate. There's a lot of things in the Pythagorean school that is in very close alignment with Orphism. But the big contribution of Pythagoras is that he is understanding all of reality as essentially being number. He's got this very spiritual idea around mathematics and the numerical reality of everything. He also has various conceptions of the soul that, again, are very similar to Orphism, including reincarnation and an emphasis on community. Now, during the time of Socrates, we have the rise of the sophists and the sophists get a really bad rap. And I want to I want to give them a little bit of props here or try to explain them a bit, because I think they're given a bad rap often without really understanding what they are. So Athens is obviously the first democracy, but pretty quickly after Athens becomes a democracy, you have the rise of democracies in other city states as well. One of the implications for this is that you have all these cities that suddenly are not being governed by people who are coming to power through heredity and therefore haven't been trained for it. So suddenly in a democracy, and these are direct democracies, so there's a lot of people involved in all the different decisions. If you want to get anything done, <laughs> anything done, you suddenly have to be able to persuade a lot of people. So you also have then the rise of these teachers that begin moving from city state to city state and teaching people who want to be of service to their community about rhetoric. So you have this first original idea of what is rhetoric and these teachers of rhetoric. In addition to that, they're often training these people in these different city states about just the pragmatic, how you govern a society, because this is not something that has really been a part of people's experience in the same way before outside of hereditary elites. So the sophists are these traveling teachers who are going around from city state to city state. And what they're trying to do is teach people how to create persuasive arguments and also some of the basic pragmatics about statecraft. And they tend to be heavily relativistic. So Protagoras is one who says man is the measure of all things. And basically this approach is to say, well, we're all entitled to our own opinion. And you can kind of see 
why that might be appealing in this kind of a circumstance. One of the other roles that the sophists, as well as actors, had is because they were moving from place to place, they were often sent on missions of diplomacy. So this kind of trying to smooth everything over and keep people from going to war was a really important thing. And that's part of how they end up in this very relativistic position and deeply pragmatic position. Now, Socrates is completely against relativism. The position that Socrates would have to this is not only that, you know, um, rejecting this idea that everyone's entitled to their own opinion. From Socrates' perspective, no one is entitled to their opinion. It is, in fact, our duty to try to move from opinion to knowledge. So he has no patience for relativism. He also is very deeply skeptical about trying to really understand how is it that we know what we know? Do I really know this or do I just believe it in ways that ultimately when I begin questioning it, it's unfounded? So part of what Socrates does is incredibly important is he begins to the turn from looking outward to looking inward. So he begins asking, okay, well, what is the nature of reason and really trying to understand that? And he founds a method called dialectic, which is a form of structured conversation in which through this structured conversation, you are using your mind and reason to move from opinion to knowledge. So this is this very important method that he creates. And his primary focus throughout his life is always on trying to find the good. What is the good? Plato's, it, Plato is Socrates' most important student. And after Socrates is martyred by the Athenian state, Plato then founds the academy to build on the work of his teacher. And he is, of course, one of the major sources for which we know anything about Socrates. Now, Aristotle says that one of Plato's main personal contributions building on Socrates is the doctrine of the forms or the ideas. These are words that get used interchangeably in Platonic discourse. So the idea of this is that we have all of this manifested world, things that are constantly changing, but somehow there is a source archetype that is immortal. So it doesn't change, it's eternal, and it is ultimately the source of the manifested many things, that there is a archetype, an idea, a form of the good, of beauty, of justice. And those things that we have in the world that we could look at and say, this is just, or this is good, or this is beautiful. It's all because they are participating in reflections of these archetypes. So that is Plato's main contribution here. And he has along with this various theories of knowledge, and the soul, including the idea of platonic recollection, which is that because we humans exist on all these different levels, when we know something, when we have that, that circumstance where we really know something, it's because we're actually remembering it. We're remembering it because we also have existed there and we are already in some prior transcendental state in contact with the forms, the archetypes, the ideas. He also, because again, you know, throughout all of ancient Greek philosophy, what is the nature of reality? What does it mean to live a good human life? He has a lot of speculation on the state in political philosophy in terms of our politics is how we build societies in which we can be working for the good to lead a good human life is to help individual and groups of humans lead a good human life is the purpose of the state. And in order to do that, it has to be in alignment with the nature of reality. So that is during the time of Socrates. Now, Plato's most important student is Aristotle. Aristotle did not know Socrates. Socrates was already dead before Aristotle came into the picture, but Aristotle studied with Plato for 20 years before Plato died. And then once Plato died, 
one of Plato's relatives took over the academy and Aristotle went to become the tutor of Alexander the Great and his cohort. And then later he came back to Athens and founded his own school, the Lyceum. And they are called the Peripatetics because they would walk while they were having their discourse. One of the things that I absolutely love and admire about Aristotle is he is amazingly precise. He has just an incredibly precise mind. And actually, he is the one that founds the discipline within philosophy that is logic. And I do not have that type of precision in my mind. And so I read Aristotle and try to sharpen my mind. And I'm just awed by it. It's He's really amazing as far as that goes. And so, as I said, I think that Plato, or I think that Aristotle did not, you know, um, have a huge break from Plato, but I do think he definitely has some very important correctives. And one of the most important is this. Aristotle looks at Plato's ideas about the forms and his critique of Plato is you have this idea of the archetypes, but you never actually explain in any way that is not sloppy, <laughs> it's not intellectually sloppy, how it is that they are causal to the many things. So he's like, you, there's a separation in your thinking where you've got these archetypes and then you've got the manifolded world and you've never adequately explained the causation. And that's one of his most important critiques of Plato. I think some of the other differences are really kind of a difference in temperament and focus. Aristotle is very empirical, he's incredibly practical, and he has a much stronger focus on eminence, like the divine eminent. Plato is almost exclusively interested in the divine transcendent. And Aristotle has his metaphysics and he has a number of other things. It's not that he doesn't care about that, but his real focus is on the eminent. And that is a difference. He also has a strong focus on Ariti. So Ariti is a Greek word and it can be translated in two different ways. And it really means the same thing um, if you understand it kind of in this particular way. It's virtue, which is like the moral virtues, but it also can be understood as excellence. So it's really about the excellence that is inherent. So virtue, if you think about herbalism, you know, virtue is the purified essence of the rarefied essence of a living thing. What are the excellences that are truly there for humans? What is the excellences that we really have and how do we develop those? Again, very pragmatic is Aristotle. Also arising after Socrates is Stoicism, the Stoics. So the Stoics, in terms of their metaphysics, are much more like the pre-Socratics in terms of they have a form of material monism. And they are very interested in how do we live in agreement with nature? That is a very big emphasis that they have. They also put an incredibly strong emphasis on purifying the negative emotions, purifying those emotions that cause trouble, you know, hatred, sadness, um, anger, things like that, purifying negative emotions, and then on fulfilling one's duty. So that's kind of the emphasis on stoicism. Now, there are other schools as well that for what I'm talking about are not as important. Those would be like the cynics, the skeptics, and the Epicureans. There's a lot out there, and it's very fun to explore. So in Roman times, because you have ancient Greek philosophy, it gets spread through Hellenism, they're having various kinds of influences from different places. And then in the time of Rome, you have this great synthesis movement, which is Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism is synthesizing Platonism, Aristotelianism, Stoicism, and it also has some Pythagorean thought mixed in with some mysticism. And our three main people there, you have Plotinus is often recognized as kind of the granddaddy of Neoplatonism. So he's the first. You have Iamblichus and Proclus. And they took up this challenge that Aristotle had pointed to in Platonic theories of, you know, the separation between the manifold world and these transcendent archetypes. And they addressed it through the doctrine of emanation. This will sound very familiar to anyone who is uh, very versed in theosophical thought as well, because emanation is a very important part of that. And they also make very explicit the practice of philosophy as a process of union with the one. So now I'm going to give you, this is, I'm, I'm relying here on Plotinian, so Plotinus, um, his version of this. It's further elaborated by Yamblis 
Yambicus and Proclus sometimes in ways that I don't think are necessary. Like sometimes I think they overcomplicate it a little. So we're just going to stick with Plotinus here for right now. So this is the theory from Plotinus about how we move from the one down into the world of the many things and how they're related to each other. So first he postulates that there is the one. The one is neither being nor is it non-being. It has no attributes. It has neither subject nor object. It is everything. And it is everything. It is nothing. It is all of this. It is beyond all. <laughs> and so you have the one. And then one of the things about the one, so this is, if you're going to um, try to draw an analogy over into Indian philosophy, you would say that this is Nirguna Brahman. So you have the one. At some point in time, for reasons that we do not know, the one has self-knowledge. Now, the thing is, the one can never truly have self-knowledge because what happens is it's split then into subject and object. So think about it this way. If you have self-knowledge, what is the part of you that is perceiving the whole? What is the part that is looking at it? That is the noose, okay? So the noose is the subject and the one is the object. And so the noose is sometimes translated as like the mind of God is one of the translations is often given to it. So you have the one and then the noose is apprehending and contemplating it's basically self-knowledge here about the one. And in so doing is having thoughts and those thoughts themselves are the world soul. And that is kind of where the, um, you know, you have the archetypes, right? And so, and then all of this within the world soul, as it is contemplating up to the noose is having more thoughts. And so you have then, you know, as you're thinking about justice or all of these, then that is coming down and is coming down through this kind of like hall of mirrors almost through this emanation and the things that are in, it goes all the way down until it hits what is essentially inert matter. And that's where the, the efficacy of continuing on runs out. So inert matter in Plotinus is not like, it's not my body, right? My body is actually a combination of many different things and form and has spirit is up at a higher level. It's if you think about the way in which he means matter, it's analogous to uh, the toner in a cartridge. It's just the, the stuff that is pulled in by different things and forms to, to give substance. And so all of this then is sometimes referred to as the casting on of the mantles of density. But as we come down, everything that is down here also exists on all of these higher planes as well. So it's like I said, an emanatory scheme. And it's something that this happens as an expression of the essential nature of the being. So this is where we talk about like, it is the sun's nature to give off rays. It loses nothing of itself in shining. That is just its nature. This is the way in which you can think about this emanation schemes. This is very, very similar to the way in which in theosophical literature, you go from Atma, which is Atma is Brahma. So, you know, the one that is all of the source down into Buddhi, which is kind of like the noose, that second stage all the way down through mind until you eventually hit the physical and we exist on all of these different levels of being. Now there's a number of human challenges that are part of this structure here. First of all, we exist on all those different levels. So we talk about from one all the way down into inert matter, we as humans are existing on all of these. But part of what happens in this process as we are you know, looking up and then you're thinking and that has thoughts and that's creating the next level down from the one all the way down into the world of manifold things is I'm using the analogy here of copy degradation. So nothing in the lower levels is complete or exact replication of the realm above it. So it's kind of the idea is, you know, if you took a page of paper that had something on it and then you copied it, and then you made a copy from the copy and a copy from that copy. And eventually things get kind of fuzzy. There's some distortion that creeps in. And then that is considered that kind of distortion and degradation through all of this kind of coming down is considered to be the root of most of our problems. Another thing is that as we are coming down these levels and we are in a body, 
and are born into a body, we are pretty immediately aware of our physical selves. We're immediately aware of more of our um, separated selves. And we tend to identify with those aspects of selves. self. We do not tend to identify with some of the higher levels of self and we're not as easily active on them. So if we want to take a look at this real fast through like a theosophical perspective where manas is considered mind, when you come into incarnation, you know, we are having to we're aware and awake and alive and often identifying with this lower levels. It's at Manas mind partway through there, where is the immortal aspect. And it takes effort to use those aspects of ourself. And then also to remember that that is where we really are as opposed to, and what we really are rather than the lower aspects that die away. So we're not inherently active or fit on our higher levels. It takes intentional effort. So the process of living as a philosopher, as a lover of wisdom then, means that part of what we're doing here is that we are intentionally cultivating the virtues in life. We're intentionally cultivating those excellences that are truly human. And in doing so, that is a form of purification. It also means that part of the practice here is exercising the rational parts of self through this practice of inquiry and dialectic, and that in so doing, this then makes us more active and it tends to increase our sense of identity with those parts of self that are beyond that which is sensory nor sensory correlative. Also, this particular path of philosophical contemplation can be a path of ascent. That is very clear in Neoplatonism. It's to do this particular kind of contemplation as a path of ascent towards the one. And it was very common to be in community with other philosophers, with others who were choosing to live as a lover of wisdom. Obviously, we have, you know, some of them like the Pythagoras, the Pythagorean communities. Those are actual communes where they were living together. More common is that people would assemble in schools where they would be doing their, their basic daily life, but then they would come together very regularly and be in community with each other. So now I want to return again to this, the claim of the mysteries. That ultimate teleological claim of the mysteries is that there is some alteration in the individual at the level of being in which they are immortal. So that which does not die away, that that change happens in a way that carries over through death and rebirth using the Orphic. And then clearly you see that in the Platonic as an example, and therefore those that come out of, of Plato. Now, the first thing I want to say is that I am not the first person by stretch of the imagination to suggest that this process of philosophy is doing something that is the same as the mysteries, because in fact, that was part of what was there in the ancient world. Plotinus, in his Aeneids, uses explicit mystery language, and I'm going to read you a little bit of that in a minute. Additionally, Aristophanes, the great comic playwright out of Athens, in his absolutely brutal lampooning of Socrates in the clouds, part of what he does is he shows Socrates playing the role as an initiator in a way in which everyone in the audience would have understood that was the reference and they would have understood why. So this was not an uncommon thing. Pythagoras in his school in Cretona he has a number of different structures and ways of talking and thinking that make clear use of mystery language, including inner court, outer court language. The outer court is where uh, you do your initial purification. And then the inner court is the area in which you're actually undergoing initiation. And this is actually physical. This is directly from the Eleusinian mysteries in which there is an outer court where you do the purification and an inner court and where you go through the initiation. So that's where that actually comes from. But then that use of language is something that is there elsewhere. So now I wanna go through a little bit more. I'm gonna use Plotinus because he's such a good example. And I wanna to read to you from Plotinus. And then I wanna go through a little bit more about the path of ascent. But before I start, I just wanna say in this 
thing that I'm going to read you here, listen for the path of ascent because it's laying out part of his process, but he's very clearly using mystery language. So this is from Aeneid 6, Tractate 9, verse 11. This is the purport of that rule of our mysteries. Nothing divulged to the uninitiate. The supreme is not to be made a common story. The holy things may not be uncovered to the stranger, to any that has not himself attained to see. There were not two. Beholder was one with beheld. It was not a vision compassed, but a unity apprehended. The man formed by this mingling with the supreme must, if he only remember, carry its image impressed upon him. He has become unity, nothing within him or without inducing any diversity. No movement now, no passion, no outlooking desire. Once this ascent is achieved, reasoning is in abeyance and all intellection and even to dare the word, the very self caught away, filled with God. He has in perfect stillness attained isolation and all that being calmed, he turns neither to this side nor to that, nor even inwards to himself. Utterly resting, he has become very rest. He belongs no longer to the order of the beautiful. He has risen beyond beauty. He has overpassed even the choir of virtues. He is like one who having penetrated the inner sanctuary, leaves the temple behind him, though these become once more the first objects of regard when he leaves the holies. For there his converse was not with image, not with trace, but with the very truth, in the view of which all the rest is but of secondary concern. There indeed it was scarcely vision unless of a mode unknown. It was a going forth from the self, a simplifying a renunciation, a reach towards contact, and at the same time, a repose, a meditation towards adjustment. This is the only seeing of what lies within the holies. To look otherwise is to fail. So this is clearly discussing a mystical approach of ascent and it is definitely using a ton of mystery language. And again, we went through before how in Platinian and Neoplatonic systems of emanation, we go from the one all the way down into inert matter. And what he is describing here is a process in which you then through contemplation can go back up into that place of unity, that place in which you are back in unity with the one in the holiest of holies. And part of the process here, the method that he describes in many other places, and one of the tractates that I love is on beauty. And this, what he says is that if you are someone who loves beauty, then what you do is you think about and you comprehend and you look at and then begin contemplating all of the beautiful things that are meaningful to you, beautiful works of art, uh, the beauty that you see in nature, the beauty that you see in a person, all of these different forms of the beautiful. And then you try to understand what is it through that, that is behind all of these? How can we understand and begin to go up and really touch that, which is the source that is shining through all the beautiful things. And that is beauty. And then once we are in that place in which we are in beauty, we are in touch with beauty itself then what is that aspect that is recognizing beauty? And then you are going up into the noose. And then once you are there, you surrender and submit and you go even beyond reason. And you have this experience in you kind of relax and allow this experience of unity to occur. And which, as he said, is beyond reason. So this is using this philosophical contemplation as a method for reascent. So I want to go through a little bit more practical about philosophy as a sacred practice. First of all, there is the purification 
of the self that happens through the practices of cultivating ariti, cultivating virtue, the excellences, the true excellences of humanity. And part of what is happening when you are doing that is that you are awakening and strengthening focus in that part of the self that is immortal. And you are increasingly identifying yourself as being your daimon, being your spirit. So you're identifying yourself as being that part of yourself that is immortal and putting your sense of self there. Also, the activity of actually doing this philosophical contemplation, part of what it's doing is exercising, much like lifting weights, <laughs> exercising the abstract mind, making it stronger, making you more comfortable in participating and using that part of self and identifying with it. As I just mentioned, it does have within it a path of mystical union. And so if you are awake and identified with the immortal aspects of your being while you are in incarnation, that then should remain because it does not die away across death and rebirth and therefore would function similarly to the mysteries. I want to encourage us therefore to be thinking of study as a sacred practice. And what this means is approaching philosophical study as a form of contemplative meditation. So what you're not trying to do is learn concepts. You're also not necessarily trying to create any new philosophical theories. I mean, if you want to and you can and you have that ability, great, but it's not necessary for this. But what we are trying to do is to exercise self-awareness and the ability to be active in your higher aspects. So like I said, you know, when I originally said we have all of these maps, all of these texts, it's using them as maps and trying to follow along and therefore become active and follow those thoughts that are laid out there as a form of con contemplation. And then if you desire to do so, there are quite a number of these that are meant as a path towards mystical union. And the Aeneids are one. I also think that Again, there's a lot of amazing, amazing stuff in ancient Greek philosophy about self-cultivation. So intentionally developing those virtues, those excellences, ariti, and those include the moral virtues as well as the intellectual virtues. In addition to that, it's important to note that all virtues are attained through habit. And then there's some amazing various practices that are meant to generate tranquility. So I do want to quickly talk a little bit more about some of these specifics. In the virtues, there are first, there's a group that are called the moral virtues. And these are about your character. What they do is that they tell us what the good is. And there are various lists of the virtues. Like Aristotle has a very famous one in the Nicomachean Ethics. But the idea here is to contemplate and, and identify for you, what do you think the moral virtues are? Then you would do a self-assessment of your strengths and your weaknesses, and then build a plan. So you create habits and structures to support those habits to help you develop strength where you're currently weak. And so it's very pragmatic, but also it's about deep spiritual development. And functionally, what this does is to purify the soul. At the same time, there are also the intellectual virtues. Now, the intellectual virtues include all of the different forms of reason. We have noose, which we saw a minute ago. That's that intuitive intelligence in, the, in theosophical terms of bipati. And what it does is it immediately apprehends fundamental truths. And then there's episteme, which this is our inferential reasoning and our logic. So when you take noose and episteme together and get them to work together. So you're combining this fundamental truths with inferential reason about these unchanging truths. That is Sophia. So philosophia, that is theoretical wisdom. That's usually what we're talking about. We're talking about living as a lover of wisdom. There's also phronesis. Phronesis is practical wisdom. Aristotle puts a lot of emphasis here, and I love phronesis. <laughs> it's so important, and we don't give it enough time. So, you know, you have all of these things where you understand something about what is good, but it is phronesis that tells you how you take this grand wisdom that you have discovered on a theoretical front and actually use it to make decisions. So I love phrenesis. And I think that we can all do better by looking at that and figuring out how do we now turn this into reasonable good ends. Nome is good sense. 
synesis is like how we understand each other. And so that's got a kind of um, empathetic part as well. And then techni, which is art, craft, or technological intelligence. But basically using any of these, and especially if we're doing it with intention, it is increasing the activity that we have in our immortal aspects of self and increasing our identification with them. Tranquility. The Stoics are particularly good at this. So these are a set of practices that allow you to be positively engaged in our very troubled world without being shaken to the point where you lose that clarity of identification. And, you know, this is a huge part of Stoicism. And I think there's so much wisdom in those practices. And I really encourage people to take a good look at them. So my general recommendations are platonic texts are great for that high level abstract contemplation and really getting that aspect of self moving for spiritual self-cultivation logic and keeping it real is Aristotle. Actually, my students, they love Aristotle and the quote of like Aristotle keeps it real, man, is actually from my students. And I love that. It makes me so happy. Um, but also this idea of how you can have tranquility and still do your duty while moving through a very troubled world, Stoicism has so much to offer.